You are live in the CNN newsroom. Thank you so much for joining us. And on behalf of Syracuse University's Newhouse School, welcome to the 12th annual awarding of the Toner Prizes for Excellence in Political Reporting. I'm Boris Sanchez, a CNN anchor and a proud graduate of the Newhouse School, which is home to the Robin Toner Program in Political Reporting. This event and these prizes honor another Newhouse alumna, the late Robin Toner, who was the first and so far the only woman to be the chief political correspondent for the New York Times. In her honor, these awards recognize the day in, day out work of political reporters across the country who respect facts and their audience, who understand that only by getting it right can they keep citizens informed and thereby keep democracy alive. These journalists will dog a story until they get it, often overcoming substantial personal risk poor pay, and even occasionally their own common sense. Tonight we'll be recognizing the very best of political coverage, both national and local, produced in 2021, a year that started with an insurrection at the U.S. Capitol and ended with lingering variants of a pandemic that seemed like it would never let go. You're going to hear from Robin's now 24-year-old twins, Nora and Jake, You'll hear from leaders of Syracuse University and the Newhouse School, and from someone who's been described as the most powerful woman in American politics and the most powerful speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives in more than half a century, Nancy Pelosi. And of course, you'll hear from the winners, too. Now, last year's MC, my CNN colleague and fellow Newhouse graduate Melanie Hicken, predicted the Toner Prizes event would be back in full in-person glory by now. Obviously, it's not, thanks to COVID, but I'm going to go out on a limb here and make a prediction. The Toner Prizes celebration will come roaring back in person at this very time next year. We're grateful you're with us now, and we hope that you'll be with us then. Before we kick off tonight's festivities, there are a few thanks in order to Bloomberg, Google, and the Knight Foundation for supporting the Toner program even de during these lean years of the pandemic. To all the jurors and judges across the country who've helped make the Toner Prizes the preeminent award in American political reporting. And to all of you and your loyalty and crucial support. Thanks as well to Newhouse Dean Mark Lodato, who arrived at the Newhouse School two and a half years ago, already supporting the program as a previous judge, and who brought with him an entrepreneurial spirit that's already making things happen on campus, and soon will also make things happen here in Washington, too. Dean Lodato, the digital floor is yours. Good evening and welcome to the 2022 Toner Prizes celebration honoring excellence in political reporting. I'm Mark Lodato, Dean of the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications. First, thank you to CNN anchor Boris Sanchez for serving as our master of ceremonies. Boris is a 2009 graduate of our broadcast and digital journalism program and a member of what we call the Newhouse Network are highly successful, loyal alumni who can be found at media organizations around the world. We are proud of them and the work they do. I'm now in my second year as Dean of the Newhouse School, but my first calling was journalism. And I spent more than 15 years as a reporter in cities around the US, gaining a firsthand understanding of the vital role journalism plays in our democracy. I am deeply committed to the profession and grateful for the opportunity to recognize this important work with the Toner Prizes. In just over a decade, the prizes have become one of the most significant awards honoring political reporting. And year after year, our judges continue to be impressed by the quality of the work submitted to the competition. That work is also an inspiration to the scores of aspiring journalists who graduate from the Newhouse School each year and go into the field striving to live up to the great reporters like Robin Toner who went before them. But as you well know, our students are beginning their careers during a fraught time for the profession. Be they financial, political, or technological, the factors affecting journalism and its future are many. Yet as the Dean of a Communications School, I am heartened to find that our students are undeterred. In fact, they are invigorated by the challenges of this new era. We are committed to giving them the tools to face those challenges. 
towards that end, the Newhouse School, in collaboration with the highly ranked Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs, is working to advance thought leadership and the student experience in our nation's capital and allow Syracuse University to take a leading role in addressing some of the most pressing issues now facing our society. Loss of trust in journalism and democracy, political polarization, and the deterioration of civil discourse. As we strengthen our commitment to journalism and to our future political journalists, I hope some of you will join us. Please now join me in welcoming the Chancellor of Syracuse University, Kent Siverud. Thank you, Dean Lodato. I am grateful to have an experienced journalist and entrepreneurial leader at the helm of the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications. Dean Lodato understands the importance of recognizing great work. He served as a juror for the Toner Prize long before he joined Syracuse University. I'm also honored to be part of the 2022 Toner Prize celebration. National leaders and journalists alike have come to recognize this prize as one of the most distinguished awards in political reporting. The award is a fitting legacy for its namesake. Robin Tunner's insightful and exacting political reporting never lost sight of the real people impacted by the issues she covered. The entries in this year's prize competition give us hope that well-sourced reporting and journalistic integrity still matter. I'm proud of the role Syracuse University and the Newhouse School play in training the journalists of tomorrow. At Syracuse, we are encouraging our brightest students to pursue journalism, to debate critical issues, and to chart the future of the industry. As part of the Toner Program's annual whirlwind tour of journalistic DC, a group of Newhouse students is in Washington, DC now. They are meeting with news leaders and gaining perspective. They are becoming the professionals who uphold the integrity and the ethics that Robin Toner held dear. In the 12 years since the first Toner Prize was awarded, speakers have included presidents and vice presidents, former secretaries of state, governors and senators from both sides of the aisle. Tonight, we welcome the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi. She is the first and only woman in history to serve as Speaker. Speaker Pelosi has led sweeping legislative changes, including two of President Biden's top legislative priorities, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the American Rescue Plan. Currently, in her fourth term as Speaker, Pelosi has been the leader of her party for 19 years. Interviewing Speaker Pelosi is the 2013 Toner Prize winner, Molly Ball. Ms. Ball is national political correspondent for Time Magazine and the author of the best-selling biography, Pelosi. Welcome, Speaker Pelosi and Ms. Molly Ball. Madam Speaker, thank you so much uh, for being here with us. I want to start by uh, talking about the situation in Ukraine. Uh, as you know, we're here to celebrate journalism tonight, uh, and the events overseas have really highlighted the global clash between democracy and authoritarianism. We've seen Vladimir Putin essentially outlaw reporting in Russia as he tries to control the flow of information to the population there. How do you see the importance of journalism in the fight for democracy, both at home and abroad? It's good to be with you, Molly, especially as we honor Robin Toner. Uh, the situation in terms, of, let me just fundamentally say, central to our democracy is freedom of the press. Of all the First Amendment rights that are so central to our democracy, freedom of the press enables people to freely assemble and to speak and the rest because the press will be reporting on it. The fact that uh, uh, Putin is suppressing freedom of the press in uh, uh, Russia is a sign of his own insecurity because he knows because he knows that if people know, they will think differently about what he is doing. Uh, I think that the tribute that we have to pay today is to Marina O, I call her O, it's O Sinarkova, uh, who, an editor on the state-run channel, came out and, and put up the sign that she did so that people in Russia would have some idea. So it wasn't just about suppressing the press, it was about just shutting it down, shutting it down. And that is, I mean, I, I don't think that Russia has a democracy really, but whatever knowledge the public has about his going to war or arresting his opponents and the rest, uh, of course, is um, deterred by his suppressing the press. 
we have our own problems in the United States when the president talked about fake news, but we'll go into that if you wish. Um, yeah, well, what do you see as the biggest challenges uh, to the freedom of the press uh, here in the United States in particular? Well, in the United States, the, uh, the effectiveness of, of uh, the former president of the United States in undermining the press, uh, establishing a thing called fake news, it was not original with him. Uh, it, it has been with other uh, autocrats uh, previous to him to undermine the press because this, in my view, the press is the most important force for democracy, the most freedom of the press, the most important force. So it was um, uh, clever of the former president to start talking about fake news and alternative facts and things like that to undermine the, the acceptance of, a, of a, uh, a common set of facts about what was going on uh, in our country. Uh, this, this was not uh, clever, accidental, it wasn't cute, it was intentional uh, in order to undermine our democracy. And, uh, and, and how about our democracy? How do you think it's doing these days? Uh, and uh, how concerned are you about democracy here in America? Well, here's the thing. Um, our country is a great country. The American people are, are wonderful and great people and compassionate people and the rest. The, uh, and our country could withstand one term of office strong enough to withstand one term of, I don't think, two terms of office of the former president for his assault, again, on democracy, on the press, on truth, on fact, and, uh, the, and using the office of the White House as a, a force for misrepresentation. So I, I think our democracy, again, is strong enough. Uh, our president, uh, Lincoln, when he was president, he said, uh, public sentiment is everything with it. You can accomplish anything, or practically anything without it, practically nothing. Meaning that the people, the people have the say. But for people and public sentiment uh, to prevail, people have to know. And people know because of freedom of the press. And imagine in the early days of our republic when freedom, the word would go out and it'd take time to get across the whole country. But nonetheless, it was unifying. What this former president did was not unifying, but dividing for our country and uh, had a level of success with his big lie. But well, again, not anything that, that our great democracy could not withstand. Uh, and, and we've seen the, the consequences of those lies tragically on, on January 6th. You have uh, in the past few years led the House through some very hairy situations, two impeachments, one insurrection. Uh, what has guided you in those situations? What, what sort of principles do you use as your, as your North Star in those situations? Well, in, in, in terms of our country, I, we all, whatever our political beliefs and, and God bless us all for our enthusiasm for what we believe in, but fundamental to all of that is that, again, our diversity is our strength in our country. Our unity is the power of America. And that uh, whatever our differences between parties, or, well, just two now, so I say between or among different schools of thought, uh, we all have a responsibility, a responsibility uh, to our country, to America. And so uh, that's what is so different about what happened with the former uh, president, because I've been in Congress a long time, but I've been a political active, uh, you know, community activist for even longer. And whether we had a Democratic or a Republican president, we had unity for our country, patriotism for America. Uh, and could find some common ground, but not. But this former president uh, made a difference. So, what is the motivation? The motivation is again uh, to find unity, uh, to do so in a way that has transparency, accountability, and as much bipartisanship as possible. 
when I asked the Republicans and I say to them, take back your party. This isn't who you are. You're the grand old party. You've done great things for America. You take great pride in that. They say, well, we can't beat them in the primary. You have to beat them in the general. And then we can come back and have our usual debate with you about the role of government and the differences that we have uh, within a system of democracy without undermining it. Well, and you were you, uh, accused of, of partisanship and of being divisive uh, with those impeachments, uh, particularly that first impeachment, which had to do with Ukraine. I mean, do you think that that looks differently in retrospect? Have, have recent events sort of uh, highlighted the importance of that? I think that in light of, in retrospect, it looks even more uh, deadly serious that we did that. I, w I, I was, if you see the record, people wanted me to impeach President Bush because of the war in Iraq, which I mightily opposed and did not think that the intelligence supported the threat he, he put put forth, but uh, I was not going to impeach President Bush. Uh, the elections are about taking, uh, making change in who is president of the United States and who leads the Congress and the rest. Uh, so I, did, I was not inclined to impeachment. But when the president, the former president, did what he did on that phone call with the president Zelensky, he gave me no choice. Here was a president who was undermining our national security, undermining the integrity of our elections in a way that is, was appalling, and he professed to not even know the difference between right and wrong. But that was an assault on our Constitution, and there, there was no choice but to impeach him. That. Now, as we look back and see that he was withholding money, uh, uh, weaponry for a while, $400 million in support for Ukraine that President Zelensky was uh, asking for, and you've got to do me a favor and all of that. It's, a, it's very interesting to me that the whole country did not rise up and say, okay, that's enough, Mr. That's not what our president is supposed to do, is to try to use another uh, our support for another country who is trying to protect its democracy uh, to undermine our own democratic elections. Well, I don't and, think and that so was partisan at all. I thought that was patriotic. I thought it was honoring our constitution. And this president gave us no choice. This former president gave us no choice. Well, and, and many people saw the, the, the former president as sort of exposing some of the, the weaknesses in our democracy. What has Congress done uh, since he left office to, to shore up democracy and to, to prevent that from happening again? And, and, and what more needs to be done in your view? Well, the first thing we did was to win the election in 2018. I thought that was very crucial. You know, uh, Ron, we've said, I was going to call you Robin, Molly, we wonderful Robin. It, we um, we all, uh, have said again and again, this is the most important election of our time. And it just keeps getting to be more crucial and more important. Uh, we, when he got elected, oh my gosh. So 18 to win back, the, to win the House was a crucial election. And, uh, and so that's one thing we did to help our democracy was win uh, the Congress in 2018. Uh, we have legislation in the Senate now that I wish they would pass. And it is uh, legislation that supports our democracy. At the same time, following January 6th, with the President of the United States incited an insurrection on our country, on the Congress, on the Capitol, on our Constitution, um, we have legislation that can correct some of what is happening to continue that undermining of our democracy across the country. Over about 400 bills have been introduced in about 18 states. Some of them have become law uh, to suppress the vote, to nullify elections. Suppress the vote is undemocratic. Nullifying the election is unconstitutional. And that just takes us away from being a democracy. So we have to continue that fight. We don't want to be fear mongers and you know, scare people as to what they are doing. But we do have to make sure that democracy prevails. 
United States of America. I was in Philadelphia this past week for our issues conference. We went to Constitution Hall. We went to the um, Independence Hall too. And at Independence Hall, we saw where President Washington had the peaceful transfer of power from the first president to the second president, John Adams. It is always emotional to see that peaceful transfer of power, but in light of what happened January 6th, uh, more than emotional. Uh, it's, it's a really a call to action for us to make sure that the public understands what is at stake when you let the big lie just take over the discussion. Fake news, big lie, all of that. Very, very dangerous, very clever, in keeping with other autocrats in history. Well, and the some of the legislation you described, particularly on, on voting rights, we saw that uh, uh, fail in the Senate, but there have there do appear to be bipartisan talks to amend uh, the Electoral Count Act. Uh, do you support those talks? Do you think that's good enough? Yeah, I support those. I think that's really important for us to do, but it is no substitute for uh, passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. It's no substitute for passing our freedom to vote legislation, but it is important to do so that we have uh, a clarity in the public mind as well as in the in the Congress as to uh, what the role is of the uh, of the Electoral College. That was ridiculous for the president to say that the president, the vice president, could overturn uh, the certification of the states. I mean, really, in our country. Really, and, and I'm, I'm, I have been quite disappointed that many more uh, established Republicans have not spoken out against that. Some have, and of course, we're very proud, some in the Congress, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger and the rest, who have been courageous in how they have spoken out for our democracy. But more, I think, more serious established Republicans, not necessarily in Congress, because clearly, there's a level of, of cowardice there that, it, let's just say those who are not at risk politically should be saying a lot more. And you mentioned uh, the midterm elections in 2018 that uh, of course returned you to, to the speakership. Uh, we've got a midterm election this year. Most people saying it doesn't look very good uh, for your party. Uh, how do you see the, the midterms going and, and what do you see as the potential consequences if Democrats lose Congress? I don't have any intention of the Democrats losing the Congress in November. Uh, the uh, so-called conventional wisdom, uh, well, there's nothing conventional anymore uh, because of the way people communicate with social media and, and how they receive their information, how they're called to action, how they're called to meetings, and the rest is quite different. So any assumptions, past assumptions about elections or obsolete. People said, well, history shows. Well, history, we're talking about the future. And I've been traveling the country. The response we're receiving is overwhelming. I'm, I'm so proud uh, because we do have a plan. We have a vision of victory. We have a plan to get it done. Uh, we're going to own the ground, uh, uh, not, um, mobilizing. You have to mobilize. You have to message. You have to have the money to get it done. If I just need to be so crude as talk politics, you brought up the subject. I'm proud of our chairman, Mr. Uh, Sean Patrick Maloney, and the work that he is doing. But all of our members are pitching in in terms of recruitment, in terms of mobilizing and the rest. And uh, again, when we won in 06, we didn't have a president, a Democratic president in the White House. And we had our own message and we won. In 18, we didn't have a Democratic president in the White House capital D or small D, and we we won the Congress. And now, uh, this time we do, we have a great president, a president with a great vision for America, tremendous knowledge about um, legislation and the law, a strategic thinker in how to get things done, and a person of great empathy to emotionally as well as intellectually connect with the American people. Uh, so as we get closer, uh, to the campaign season, uh, working with the president, with our 
message of empathy, progress, and hope for the American people, as well as the, uh, uh, the excellence of our members of Congress, as well as our candidates who are running in other districts. Uh, we have every intention of winning. It is absolutely essential for our democracy that we win. I fear for our democracy if the Republicans were ever to get the gavel. We can't let that happen. Democracy is on the ballot in November but more important to people in their daily lives because they may not see that danger and we don't want to be fear mongers, are their kitchen table concerns, whether it's how they're going to pay the rent, the, buy food, uh, educate their children, provide for pensions for the seniors and the family, whatever uh, their needs are, their kitchen table needs. They have to talk that over at the kitchen table and it keeps them up at night. That is our agenda. Uh, for the people, for working families in our country. And we feel very positive about our prospects. It has nothing to do with history and everything to do with the future. Well, you mentioned the president, but most Americans these days don't seem to share your your positive assessment of him. His approval ratings are quite low. Is that is that going to be a, an obstacle uh, for the Democrats keeping the House? And do, do you uh, see House Democrats potentially distancing themselves from the president or, or repudiating him in some way? Absolutely, positively not. This is a great president. And uh, no, and, and I mean, I, with all due respect to polling, uh, we saw what it told us in the last election. But the fact is, is that we intend to turn out our vote. Everything else is a conversation except owning the ground and turning out the vote. And just since you want to talk politics, the fact is in 2018, we won 40 seats, 31 of them in uh, Trump districts, 31 of them in Trump districts that Trump had won. Had won. So when people said, well, you've won, now we can work on the Senate and the presidency. Yes, we should, but we don't forget about us because now comes the hard part. What's his name is on the ballot. And our members who were able to win in those Trump districts with what's his name on the ballot are ironclad. We don't take anything for granted, but we feel pretty strong holding the house, but we don't wanna just hold the house. We want to add to our seats. Redistricting, everybody said redistricting was gonna be horrible for the Democrats. Remember that? Not so, not so. Uh, if anything, we'll pick up seats rather than lose 10 to 15, which, conventional wisdom said that we would. There's nothing conventional anymore, and it certainly ain't wisdom. So, and nobody's going to be rejecting the president. This president, I I, um, I had the privilege of uh, introducing him in Philadelphia last week to our issues, uh, recently at our issues conference, and I was telling my colleagues that when I was a student, I was at President Kennedy's inauguration most of them weren't, many of them weren't even born. And, uh, and I said that everybody knows the President Kennedy said to citizens of America, ask not what our country can do for you. We you know that phrase. I mean, everybody knows that. School kids know that. But the very next sentence is what I said to the President. The next sentence, Mr. President, was about you. The next president was about you because the president said to citizens of the world, that's not what America can do for you, but what you, we can do working together for the freedom of mankind. And that's exactly what President Biden has been doing, working together with other countries, not in any condescending way, but in a collaborative way, working together. He masterful was in a Munich um, security conference a few weeks ago, People were so complimentary about the fact that America was back to the transatlantic uh, alliance, very strongly supporting NATO, but that our president played the appropriate role in bringing, working together for the freedom of mankind. I'm very proud of him. This award is named for uh, the late Robin Toner, who was such a trailblazer for women in political journalism. Uh, have you watched the composition of the press corps change over your years in office? What are your observations about that? What is exciting for me is to see so many women in the press corps, when women of color as well. And of course, Robin uh, set the tone for that, a, a person of excellence, a real journalist, 
uh, she wasn't, it didn't have the role that she had because she was a woman. She had the role she had because she was the best and she happened to be a woman and a model uh, to so many other uh, young women in journalism. So I, when I walk in the room and see so many uh, women, and many young women uh, making their mark in journalism, it's pretty exciting. And you know what is exciting too, Molly, is that they're so enthusiastic about what they do. They understand their role. And many young people that I talk to or listen to in college and graduate school or just aspiring into the workforce are attracted uh, to journalism and to communications. And uh, I think that's so wholesome. As with politics and government, nothing is more wholesome than journalism, freedom of the press, than the increased participation of women. And when I look back and see some of the women, like Helen Bentley, like years ago when I was a girl, she was covering my father in politics. Now that's ancient history. But some of these women were really competitors. Now, and Robin is a, another generation when not only is she in the field, but she's a leader. She was a leader in the field. Um, that's pretty exciting. So I, I as with politics, it, has, it, it hasn't been for the faint of heart for women to make their mark in a very competitive um, arena. And now I'm seeing, we're seeing more women heading up the news, this or that. And I think that it's a, it's a it's wonderful sight to see. And it's, again, more democratic more uh, views on the subject. And I mean, just women take great pride. Women take great pride in seeing other women succeed and dads see that their daughters can do that. And that's what's interesting to me. It's so many dads saying, my daughter can do that. There's a door open for my daughter. So I, I think it bodes well, not just for women in journalism, uh, but for women in our future in the country. And uh, I, I know Robin worked for the New York Times. I know you're a longtime reader of, of the New York Times, yeah. even when you weren't living on the, the East Coast and, and a particular fan of the crossword, I have to ask, uh, have you done the Wordle? You know, I haven't done Wordle yet. Uh, I have complete devotion to the New York Times crossword puzzle. I mean, that's just the way it is. I, but I look forward to it at the end of the day or on Sunday. My family's like, I'm in my zone, just leave her alone for now. But I haven't gotten to Wordle because at any time I get involved in something like that, it becomes total. And that must not take very long. Uh, and I look forward to engaging in it. But for now, uh, my uh, therapy, my relaxation, my... Uh, uh, enjoyment this is the New York Times crossword puzzle. And I do almost any crossword puzzle that comes for me, but the one that I look forward to is, because you know, you have to do it every day if you're going to succeed on Friday and Saturday. Sunday's easy compared to Saturday, in my view. So you have to keep doing it. Uh, well, Madam Speaker, thank you so much for, for being here with us. Thank you for your time. Uh, and uh, And thank you for this wonderful conversation. Well, it's my honor to be part of something that pays tribute to Robin Toner. Uh, it's an honor to be with her family and to be with you uh, because it, she, again, was a leader, a pioneer. Uh, she took risks. She succeeded. And as I say, they wanted the best, happened to be a woman, Robin Toner. Thank you, Speaker Pelosi. It's now time to recognize our winners. In 12 short years, the Toner Prizes have become one of the most prestigious awards in American journalism. That is thanks in no small measure to the New York Times, Robin's home paper, whose senior editors helped family and friends start the Toner program, and whose then publisher, Arthur Sulzberger Jr., provided generous initial funding. It's also thanks to former USA Today publisher, Larry Kramer, a Newhouse alumnus and member of the Syracuse University Board of Trustees and the Newhouse Advisory Board. 
Larry found merit in the program and the event, and he's generously supported both. Every year since its inception, the Toner Prizes contest has sought the best in political reporting in any medium across any platform, celebrating coverage that illuminates the electoral process, reveals the politics of policy, and engages the public in democracy. And every year since they were 12, Robin's now adult children have presented the award. Jacob Toner Goslin is a pre-doctoral fellow at Northwestern University and an honors graduate in economics and mathematics from the University of Chicago. He's here to present this year's Toner Prize for local reporting. Jacob. Hi all. If last year taught us anything, it's that democracy is not only a fragile enterprise, but a local one. In the months between November and January, the peaceful transition of power rested on the actions of little-known bureaucrats administering elections across the country, and on state representatives and state senators fulfilling duties largely unknown to the general public. In this environment, with misinformation rampant, ensuring the accountability of these actors was a task of paramount importance. Tonight's winners rose to that task. They dug through the statutes, spent long hours at the State House, and reconstructed in stunning detail one of the biggest election disputes in modern American history. This is the kind of local reporting our democracy depends on. And as such, I'm honored to present this year's Toner Prize for Excellence in Local Political Reporting to David Wicker, Greg Bluestein, Mark Neese, Maya T. Prabhu, Tia Mitchell, and Isaac Sabatai of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Thanks so much. Hi, I'm David Wickard of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. We want to thank the Newhouse School and the Toner Prize for honoring our story about efforts to overturn the presidential election in Georgia. If you were a political reporter covering a swing state, 2020 was intense. It was one of the most consequential elections of our lifetime, and it didn't end in November. In fact, the pace of events only intensified after voters cast their ballots. We covered two recounts of the presidential election results, allegations of fraud, lawsuits, legislative hearings, investigations, audits, protests, press conferences, presidential phone calls, and that was just the presidential election. At the same time, in Georgia, we were covering two runoff elections for U.S. Senate that ultimately gave Democrats control of that chamber. And we did a good job of covering those events. It was exhausting, but also exhilarating. It felt like Georgia was the center of the political universe, and it was our story. Uh, but even as these events unfolded, it was clear that things were going on behind the scenes that we couldn't quite get at or adequately explain to our readers. That began to change as the months went by. More details began to trickle out through our own reporting, but also through the reporting of news organizations like the New York Times, the Washington Post, Politico, CNN, and others. Uh, more information came out through congressional investigations and books written by and about the key participants. Um, last summer, Jim Galloway, the AJC's former political columnist, suggested connecting some of the dots between new information coming out of Washington and what we had seen here. Uh, that idea grew into a massive investigation that involved our entire politics team. One of the most important things we did was put together a timeline of events by going back and examining our own reporting and the reporting of other news organizations. That allowed us to see uh, events in a new light and see patterns that we didn't necessarily see the first time through. And I'll give you just one example. On January 2nd, 2021, President Donald Trump called our Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, and he asked him to find just enough votes for Trump to win Georgia. And we reported that on that when it happened, but piecing together this timeline, timeline allowed us to see other important events that happened on January 2nd that we didn't know about at the time. For example, you know, that was the day that a memo written by Trump attorney John Eastman began circulating among some U.S. senators. This was the memo that laid out a legal rationale for Vice President Mike Pence to refuse to accept legitimate presidential electors from Georgia and other swing states. January 2nd was also the day that a handful of state legislators from Georgia drafted a letter urging Pence not to accept our state's presidential electors. And it was the day a senior Justice Department official pressured the acting attorney general to send a letter to Georgia, uh, urging our officials to consider selecting an alternative slate of electors who presumably would vote for Donald Trump. All of this happened on the same day, but we didn't know that at the time. And putting together the timeline allowed us to show our readers 
how broad and coordinated this campaign to overturn the election really was. And that campaign to sow doubt on the 2020 election isn't over. Several candidates running for top offices in our state this year continue to spread false information, false allegations that the presidential election was stolen. Uh, so this isn't an exercise in looking back for us. It's an exercise in making sure Georgia voters are informed about allegations that are being made on the campaign trail right now. This was very much a team effort at the AJC. Political reporter Greg Bluestein witnessed many of these events as they unfolded and was able to retell parts of the tale in a compelling way using new information. Our legislative reporters, Mark Nisi and Maya Prabhu, talked to some of the key state officials involved in these events. Tia Mitchell, our Washington correspondent, talked to federal officials and reported on the congressional investigation. And editors Susan Potter, James Salzer, and Sean McIntosh gave us invaluable feedback as we assembled our story about the election. Finally, audience specialist Isaac Sabatai and a team of web designers led by Donella Cohen helped us produce compelling multimedia stories with photos, videos, and documents that allowed our readers to experience these events in a new way. Again, we wanna thank the folks at the Newhouse School and the Toner Prize for honoring our work. Our, our country needs deep, thoughtful political reporting and your efforts to honor stories that you believe fit the bill can only encourage better reporting. So thank you. Political reporters are the workhorses of American journalism, and a good news organization is expected to field a strong political team. Mixing it up with political leaders and competing with colleagues was thought to be motivation enough for reporters to do their job excellently. But with political leaders and their followers, especially at the national level, more inaccessible, and in many cases more unreliable and even outright hostile, Political reporters deserve greater recognition for the invaluable service they perform. The Toner Prizes were launched in part to provide just that recognition, to pick out the very best coverage during a year, highlight it, and reward it. Nora Toner Gosling is a community organizer and affordable housing advocate with the Cooperative Development Institute, working in Providence, Rhode Island. She's also a magna cum laude graduate of Brown University, She's here to present the Toner Prize for National Political Reporting. Nora. Thank you for joining us for this year's Toner Prize event. First, I'd like to take a moment and thank Charlotte Grimes, who is the program's founding director, has helped it grow for more than a dozen years and will be leaving us after this year. Without her, there would have been no Toner program. Thank you, Charlotte. This year, the Toner Prize for Excellence in National Political Reporting goes to the staff at the Washington Post for their project, The Attack, which investigates the causes, events, and aftermath of the January 6 attack on the US Capitol. The story begins on September 26, 120 days prior to the attack, when during a Harrisburg, Pennsylvania rally, former President Trump first alluded to the obscure constitutional process in which Congress is involved in deciding election results. Through meticulous reporting and interviews with more than 230 people, the Post reconstructs the path into the Capitol, the violence and bloodshed that unfolded during the insurrection, and the disinformation that spread in its wake. Readers see on full display all the red flags that led to the moment the Capitol was breached and are then taken months out for a sense of what the attack might mean for our country's democracy. As one judge put it, this is a powerful, comprehensive look at January 6, 2021, that, quote, uses brilliantly all the tools of modern digital journalism in a spectacular collaboration of reporters, editors, photographers, and digital specialists. For this vital and remarkable work, it is my honor to present this year's Toner Prize for Excellence in National Political Reporting to the staff at The Washington Post. On behalf of the Washington Post, I would like to thank the Toner family, the judges, and Syracuse University for this terrific award. The attack was one of the most ambitious and innovative projects the Washington Post has ever undertaken. Our investigations spanned five months and ultimately involved more than 70 journalists across the newsroom. We dedicated that time and effort because of how consequential that day has become. 
We felt a duty to document everything we possibly could that explained that explain what led to the attack, what happened during it, and what has come after. We also wanted to present it in the most engaging and captivating way we could imagine to ensure that people would watch, listen, and read. We're incredibly honored that those efforts are being recognized with the Toner Prize, and we'd like to talk for a couple minutes about how the project came to be, starting with Matea Gold, who is the reason there was a project to begin with. Matea, tell us about the email you sent to a few of us in May and why you felt so strongly about this line of coverage. Well, it was apparent by that time in the year that Congress was not going to be able to pull together an independent commission to look at the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Uh, and as I was watching that, I thought, you know, we, there really is not going to be a historical accounting of what was essentially an assault on the branch of the federal government. And I, I remember sending an email to you and several other editors saying, you know, we really have a public service obligation here to tell the the fullest and most revelatory story, not just about what occurred on that day, but what led up to that moment and really what has transpired since. Uh, and the project that resulted from that, I feel brought to bear not only new facts about what occurred and precipitated the attack, but really how that's fundamentally changed our country and the relationship between a lot of people and their elected leaders. Aaron, you had to take on the challenge of the before chapter. What were the key questions you thought needed to be answered and how did you and your colleagues go about answering them? Well, after Matei and you, Stephen, laid out this vision, we had a brainstorming meeting. Uh, and when we wrote them all down, there were simply pages and pages of questions that we had uh, about January 6th that hadn't been answered. Many centered around how. How did this happen? How did law enforcement and the military and so many others charged with national security come to be so unprepared? So six months after the attack, we largely started over. We went and re-interviewed everyone, uh, combined hundreds of officials. We went through thousands of court documents to find those who've been ch charged. And we pushed for documents, ultimately obtaining many that were previously unreported, including some internal FBI documents. And we found that as the president had been encouraging his supporters to come to DC, there'd been this growing drumbeat of warnings, increasingly urgent ones, uh, that had largely been disregarded. Phil, you've been on the Trump beat uh, really since the start, uh, start of his campaign before 2016. You're our White House bureau chief through the Trump presidency. You've written two best-selling books about uh, the former president. How did January 6 fit into your understanding of, of what he was about and what he would do? And how did you go about reporting his actions on that day? Well, Stephen, January 6 felt like the culmination of you know four years of a president pushing the boundaries of what's legal, what's ethical, what's moral uh, in the office. Uh, we knew he had the capacity uh, to do what, to incite what he did on January 6th, just based on, on all of the reporting from our team at the Washington Post over those years. Uh, but after the event happened, after the attack at the Capitol, we had to try to look back and understand what exactly he was doing minute by minute uh, behind the scenes in the Oval Office between the moment uh, when he was uh, speaking to his supporters uh, at the Ellipse and urging them to march on the Capitol and the moment, uh, you know, 187 minutes later, uh, when he actually came forward and told his supporters to stand down and go home. Roz and Amy, uh, you had the, the big challenge of what came after. What were the most striking findings uh, that, that you came up with? And how did the false claims about the election reverberate across the country in the, the days, weeks, and months after January 6th? Yeah, we were interested in tracking how the forces that uh, created January 6th uh, really didn't die down after that day. Uh, the undermining of public confidence in the election results and the insidious uh, growing acceptance of violence as a possible political tool. Uh, so uh, one of the things we found is that just eight days after January 6th, there was a private meeting out in Arizona to start to plot uh, what became the Arizona ballot review uh, to continue to look back at the 2020 election and cast doubt on the results. Uh, we also found that threats of violence didn't die down after January 6th. In fact, uh, we found that uh, there were there were threats of violence made against elections officials in at least 17 states uh, in the in the days and months after January 6th. And that was just to the time uh, when our project was published. Unfortunately, uh, those numbers have only grown since. 
in addition, we really set out to try to measure the effect that this false narrative about the 2020 election had taken over the Republican Party. And so we built a spreadsheet uh, to sort of gauge uh, how many Republicans running for office in 2022 and 2021, for that matter, uh, had had accepted some uh, part of, of the false narrative, either denying President Biden's victory or voting against the uh, uh, Electoral College count on January 6th or uh, just embracing uh, some portion of uh, former President Trump's false claims about that election. And so the results of that spreadsheet by, by the fall when we were getting ready to publish was that uh, of nearly uh, more than uh, 400 candidates that we uh, cataloged at that time, a third had embraced that false narrative. And then the last thing that we, uh, we measured uh, carefully in the third chapter of the series was the number of voting laws that were passed around the country. And again, by fall, uh, more than 400 bills had been uh, uh, proposed, uh, restricting access to the ballot in some way or another, and uh, more than 30 of those passed in 19 states. Peter, in the introduction of the attack, uh, we wrote, it was not a spontaneous act nor an isolated event. Talk a little bit about why that is. How does that day fit into the broader political moment? Well, the reporting that Phil, Roz, Amy, Aaron, and others, uh, well, that they've talked about here and that many others have done um, over the past several years really showed the pressure on the country's democratic institutions um, for both the election system and the uh, many of the major agencies and institutions in Washington that uh, that are sort of guardians of democracy. They had been challenged for years, and then certainly in the months leading up to the election. And there was a ten there was a tendency in some circles out in the world on the night of January sixth and in the immediate aftermath to sort of treat that as a as an event that maybe was the end of the struggle or the end of the battle that democracy ultimately prevailed. And it was important for us in uh, talking about this project and envisioning it that one of the takeaways for readers was that January 6th was not the end of anything. It was a milestone or a milepost in an ongoing uh, struggle and an ongoing debate over the future of American democracy. Dan, you led our White House coverage through the Trump presidency. What was going through your head on January 6th and how did it fit into your understanding of the former president? Well, I think um, sort of two simultaneous thoughts that probably went through many people's heads. Um, one was the point that Phil made that it was a continuation, that it, it was kind of the, the capstone of the kind of behavior and pushing limits and seemingly no, you know, no guardrails at all kind of feeling that we had throughout the, the Trump presidency, um, but also still a, a profound sense of shock and surprise and that, that the US Capitol, you know, for the arguably for the first time since the, the British, um, it was under attack. Um, and, uh, and, and it was, I think it was an astounding uh, moment for all Americans and it was vital for us to, to dive as deeply as we could into the events of that day and almost bring a cinematic kind of uh, retelling of what every, not only what everyone saw, but new details and new insights that that we brought to bear on those faithful 187 minutes. Mateo, back to you for the final question. It's been over a year since January 6, and we're just a few months away from the next election. How should we be thinking about our democracy in the spring of 2022? I think what's stuck with us uh, the most in doing this project is looking ha at how widespread the distrust is now uh, throughout many parts of this country in our system of democracy and our system of electing our leaders. And so we really feel like it's part of our ongoing mission to be telling that story, how that's playing out around the country. This is uh, a much bigger story than about what happened on January 6th. It's really about people's relationship with their government and whether they believe that um, people are freely and fairly elected in this country. And that's a story we'll be sticking with. That's a good note for us to end on. Thank you again. We're all extremely grateful to receive the Toner Award for National Political Reporting. Before we wrap up tonight, I'd like to extend a few more thanks on behalf of the Toner Program and prizes. 
First to sponsors who've stayed with the program through this three-year hiatus from in-person gathering. Google and its communications team, Julie McAllister Torallo, Reva Littman Shudo, and Becca Rudkoff. The Knight Foundation and its new journalism vice president, Jim Brady, Bloomberg Philanthropies and News, and Craig Gordon, BN's new national editor, also a proud Newhouse alumnus. To those who were crucial to the Toner program's launch, John Chappell and Hawkeye Investment, late Gwen Eiffel, Cokie Roberts, late Newhouse Dean Lorraine Branham, the Walton Family Foundation and Walton Family Advisor Kiki McLean, the New York Times and the Ford Foundation, among others, as well as the team at Amazon Web Services who produced tonight's events, and to its leader, Luke Miller, who's been making this event work for almost a decade. To Dean Lodato and the staff at the Newhouse School, including Amanda Griffin, Carol Satchel, Holly Zahn, Rachel Cooper, Wendy Laughlin, and Jeff Pacetti. And special thanks to Newhouse student Gail Phobes, too. We also want to thank two Newhouse retirees, events coordinator Audrey Burain and Professor Emerita Charlotte Grimes. There wouldn't be a toner program, prize, or event without her dedication and drive. And personally, she had a profound impact on me. She's tough and sweet, and I know I speak for a lot of former students when I say, thanks, Professor Grimes. We're also grateful to Robin's large and loyal family, especially Bridget and Patrick McCall, and of course, her children, Nora and Jake. And finally, thank you for honoring tonight's winners, the institutions that support them, and the cause of fact-based political reporting, which Robin Toner so loved. We hope you'll be with us next year when we return live in Washington. Go Orange. Thank you and good night.